Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. For many of you who follow the channel, you know that one of my ongoing series is about how George W. Bush was actually a terrible president and how he does not deserve to be rehabilitated. Well, that got me thinking more broadly, and I came to the conclusion that I really needed to make a video series on all the neoliberal presidents to show how they're broadly the same and how the problems that our country faces today all stem from a similar cause, and that cause is a neoliberal political order which does not respond to the needs of the average citizen. And then it occurred to me, well, I can't really just dig into talking about Ronald Reagan unless I first establish an adequate context and explanation. So today what I'm going to do is define neoliberalism and then look at the origins and deep causes of the neoliberal era. So we're going to be basically doing a bit of a survey of political history in America from approximately the 1930s until about 1980. After that, what I'm going to do is then lay out very briefly the basic contributions of each neoliberal president. So that way you'll have a good idea of what the series will be like and you can decide whether you want to watch the follow-up videos accordingly. So let's get into the most basic question. What is neoliberalism? So to address the first problem first, what is neoliberalism? In an American context, I would define neoliberalism as a right-leaning or right-wing pro-corporate consensus on economic policy and a pro-war and interventionist foreign policy combined with fierce battles over identity that are often divorced from policy substance. And by the way, if someone has a better idea for how to define that, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. Um, and what I mean by these fierce battles over identity that are divorced from policy substance are issues like how many gender identities there are and whether NFL players should have to kneel for the national anthem. The reason why these things are divorced from policy substance is that it's not really easy to see what kind of legislation or governmental action could really be done to resolve these issues even if we somehow arrived at the correct answer. Um, so these issues are largely a distraction and if they are being presented on a political stage as actionable then really debating them as political issues rather than simply social issues is a complete and total misuse of media time. Neoliberal Democrats are on the left only in the sense that their social views tend to be liberal or moderate and that they can quibble over details with Republicans. For instance, they can quibble over the exact rate of the minimum wage, or they can say that we should bomb a country rather than simply invading it, as the Republicans are, are want to want to do. Uh, but if you look at the basic substance, both parties are kind of on the same page. Um, both of them agree about which countries we should be hostile to, and both of them agree on the basic direction of our economic policies. The differences are in small details. Um, and one thing that does bother me is when people try to claim that someone like Hillary Clinton is on, quote, the left, because she is definitely not on the left in any meaningful way, nor is any other neoliberal. Barack Obama was not on the left. He's only on the left among the neoliberals in government. For Republicans, it's really a little more difficult to ascribe the label neoliberalism to them, although I do think it fits, broadly speaking. Um, someone suggested that supply side or trickle down might describe them a bit better, maybe. Um, or maybe neoconservative, even though that has some extra implications that not all neoliberals fully share, as we'll see. What I would say is that with Republicans who are neoliberal, they have the same basic beliefs, they're just more strongly held, and they tend to have right-wing social views. In many ways, as we'll see as we trace the development of both the left and the right as they became neoliberal, what ultimately happens is that the Republicans developed the neoliberal ideology and the Democrats adopted it. So I would say that the term is ac applicable to Republicans, even if it seems odd to use a label like neoliberal to describe people who largely identify as conservative. But at any rate, um, that's what I'm going with for now. Um, 
So if we look at the impact of the neoliberal order, I think we can sort of see what neoliberalism stands for just based on its fruits. Um, neoliberalism has produced record profits for corporations, but poverty for everyone else, and it has a tendency to resist much needed reforms and innovations for pressing issues like climate change or ending money in politics. Because at heart, what neoliberalism is all about is helping the powerful remain powerful, helping the rich remain rich and get richer. And it is more or less, uh, I guess, one way to describe it. I think Naomi Klein is the person who came up with this phrase, but neoliberalism at its heart is total corporate liberation theology. Um, so hopefully that clarifies it enough for us to move forward. And uh, the problem, of course, is whenever you have uh, to define terms, it's never going to be a perfect definition, and different neoliberal thinkers or politicians will have some differences in perception among them. So I don't want to make it out like they're all literally exactly the same, but they're all kind of in the same general ballpark. So let's begin at the beginning. If we want to really understand the neoliberal era, we need to understand these separate evolutions of the Democratic and Republican wings of the neoliberal establishment. Let's start in the 1920s. A conservative order that had dominated the Gilded Age survived the Progressive Age and then re-emerged fully dominant during the 1920s. This order was all about laissez-faire capitalism and really just uh, a, return, a return to normalcy, as Harding put it, by which he meant no more progressive adventures in government and no more foreign interventions. This uh, period was also marked by business republicanism, which mostly involved a lot of isolationism. Uh, Republicans at this period were not very interested in being involved in the League of Nations or anything like that. The two major constituencies of the Republican Party, which was completely dominant throughout the 1920s, were the traditionalist. These are just basically people who emphasize the importance of social order and upholding the ways of the past. They have a tendency to see hierarchy and inequality as natural or even good. So when the elite businessmen just kind of ran the show, the traditionalists thought that that was in keeping with the way things were supposed to be. As long as a few people with well-established family names were among them, all was good and well. Business conservatives, uh, their mantra is best summed up in the phrase that was current in the 1920s, that the business of government is business. And basically the idea is that government should get out of the way and let business do what it's supposed to do, since business is an inherently good thing. They're against government intervention, and they're in favor of free markets. They also tend to favor the old patronage reward system over bureaucracy. They tended to like the idea that they could put their friends into office and run the government as they see fit, rather than having a bureaucracy there which would sort of maintain a style of governance between administrations. They also tended not to regard that level of nepotism and some level of kickbacks as corrupt. Um, they had a tendency to see that as simply the way that business was done um, in the business world, especially at this time, kickbacks and um, certain things that would not be accepted in government were very much accepted in the business world. Uh, you know, kickbacks, benefits, um, what amounted to bribes. So, uh, you know, their order was pretty firm until the Great Depression hit, and then we'll see that this unravels completely and gets replaced by something totally different. So, of course, the Great Depression brought about a political realignment, and the new order of the day was the New Deal Coalition. This emerged within the Democratic Party, and it would become the dominant force in American politics from the 1930s until the 1970s. So, the whole experience of the Great Depression, where an unregulated economy led to a worldwide depression, completely discredited the idea of a laissez-faire, small government approach, and it ushered in what some have called the age of big government. So one of the characteristics is that now, rather than having political appointees control the day-to-day -day functions of the government, there are bureaucratic experts who study different fields and then exercise their expertise in a way that is largely nonpartisan, at least once we get past the 30s and Republicans accept the premises of the New Deal.
government during this period actually did a pretty good job of responding to public needs and preferences, and they didn't completely ignore the plight of the poor. And what we see is that the New Deal era produced income growth for everyone, shrinking inequality, and a rising standard of living. There was a tendency in the New Deal, as opposed to the old progressive era, to not only do regulation, but also to go forward with creating new agencies and expanding the powers of the federal government. And that would be something that really occasioned a lot of backlash on the right. But keep in mind that from the 30s until the 70s, most people in the public accepted these policies and they saw them as good. The, the view of government was generally positive, that the government makes people's lives better, even though you know people would willingly acknowledge that it made mistakes and that there were some downsides to it. So this would be the new order, and it will stand for quite a while. But as we'll see, um, this new order was not without its detractors, and these are the same people who were part of the 1920s conservative coalition, and they will work behind the scenes for many years trying to make a comeback. So let's get into their story. Due to the widespread success of the New Deal coalition and its stranglehold over American politics, most of the Republican Party went to the center, and the moderate wing of the party rose up and would control things until the end of the 1970s. So the conservative business wing became more or less politically irrelevant, and they retreated into the shadows. There were other business people who ended up endorsing more moderate policies to stay relevant and in vogue. Conservatives in general felt like they were an aggrieved establishment that had been wronged in some way by the upstarts like FDR the class trader, who they also sometimes thought of as a communist or a tyrant, and they were very resentful of the New Dealers. They thought that the New Dealers were just a bunch of prick college kids who were coming in and trying to remake the world, but they didn't actually understand human nature, and that there was a natural order where the powerful are born to rule and others are born to obey. Of course, uh, after the 30s, they retreat even further into the shadows and, you know, become pretty irrelevant. They did have a bit of a resurgence. We'll talk about their one major accomplishment during this period. But uh, after Harry Truman managed to defeat his Republican challenger in a surprise election win, uh, the conservatives began to see themselves as a persecuted minority. And this is still a narrative that they hold to to this day, despite the fact that conservatives and their ideology have been in the driver's seat of American politics since 1980. It was common during the 50s and 60s to view conservatives as backward and out of touch with political reality. Uh, at that point, a lot of people thought conservatism was dead. However, there were plenty of conservatives behind the scenes who were working to rebuild the movement. And even though they hadn't won the presidency in 1948, uh, the Republicans, after their 1946 midterm victories, were able to enact one piece of legislation which would prove absolutely critical to the continued success of the eventual neoliberal era. So let's talk about that right now. So let's talk about the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which is one of the most important pieces of legislation of the entire 20th century, even if it tends to be ignored. So, as I mentioned, in 1946, the Republicans swept into Congress, and they were attempting to roll back the New Deal. They thought that with FDR dead and Harry Truman as his replacement, that they had an opportunity, and that the Democratic coalition that had built around FDR would crumble. However, they underestimated the strength of Truman and the Democrats, as we have already found out. If you'll recall the famous image of uh, all the newspapers predicting that the Republicans were going to win because they were doing their polls by phone, and they were only getting to wealthy Republican voters. Anyway, um, the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947 is the full name. Taft-Hartley is just the um, abbreviation, ba or not the abbreviation, but the colloquial name based on the two gentlemen who were most responsible for it. Um, at any rate, this is almost certainly the most important anti-labor law in American history. So, what the Taft-Hartley Act does is it makes illegal the most effective tools of labor. So if you look back at um, the 1930s, uh, 
FDR did make concessions to unions, but part of the reason why he did so is because they had effective tools in order to bring governments and businesses to their knees. So things like general strikes, where all of the organized labor in an entire city will go on strike, can shut down a city and make everyone aware of one industry or several industries' issues and the needs of their workers. Sympathy strikes are sort of in that uh, camp too, where the idea is like if you're a unionized uh, sewer worker and the police are being mistreated, you can strike in sympathy with them to show solidarity and show a broader public support. So it's labor standing with other labor. Um, other examples would be like, you know, plumbers or uh, whatever, you know, factory workers. Anyway, there's another one, uh, sit-in strikes, the idea being that if you sit in on a factory and prevent it from operating, you prevent people from uh, working for less and you force the bosses to meet some of your demands. These were really important tactics that, um, bus that unions could use in order to break a stalemate or to exert force and once those tactics are made illegal this meant that unions were greatly weakened uh, and they had to go through arbitration mandated by the National Labor Relations Board. Now, like any other part of the government, it's run by people who are a combination of bureaucrats and political appointees. This means that you need allies within the government for this uh, to work. But if everybody on this board were to be hostile to your interest, then you would not uh, get your way. So let's say the board were to be stacked with all people who are pro-corporate rather than pro-labor. Well, guess what? Labor's never going to win. So if we look at the time of the New Deal era, unions do fine because they have the National Labor Relations Board to help them out on occasion. And in general, the economy was growing, unionized jobs were increasing. So the heyday of unions actually comes after Taft-Hartley, and I think that's why a lot of people don't recognize the importance of it. However, once uh, the Democrats abandoned unions in the late 70s, early 80s, this meant that unions didn't have a political party backing them really. And without the tactics that they had used in the 1930s and before, they're now left without any wherewithal to defend themselves or to uh, try to strike out for better wages and better conditions. So uh, this is a very important event because this um, prevented any kind of labor resistance to neoliberal policies from the 1980s forward. If you'll recall, one of the chief features of neoliberalism is that there isn't really much daylight between the two parties on foreign policy. And in some ways, that is a legacy of the New Deal era, where there also wasn't all that much daylight between the two parties on foreign policy. So you could argue that rather than being an ideological development, that this was more of a carryover which has some roots in tradition. At any rate, if we look at the politics of the Cold War, we see that uh, things were a bit different than they are today. So there was still some consensus, but for the most part, Democrats were more left, Republicans were more right. Um, the idea being like Democrats are more for big changes, Republicans will acknowledge the issues but propose more incremental changes um, or watered down versions of what the Democrats want to do. This means that the partisan divide is not as stark and that there are issue-based coalitions where you can have some Democrats side with some Republicans on certain things and then switch out some individuals for a different issue. Um, so this also means, by the way, that the supposed maverick John McCain, who voted with his party like 95-ish percent of the time, would not have been considered anything like a maverick during this period, and in fact, he would have been one of the more partisan senators of this period. At any rate, um, on foreign policy, as I alluded to earlier, there was a consensus, and that consensus revolved around containing communism, seeking out fifth columns, although Republicans were much more eager to do this than Democrats. Um, this meant witch hunts, basically, for communists. And fighting proxy wars against real or perceived Soviet client states. So, for the most part, 
uh, the major leaders in both parties accepted the domino theory, the idea being that if one country falls to communism, that its neighbors will too, and that you really need to stop it before it spreads. In one way, though, the threat of communism led conservatives to be a little more flexible than they otherwise would have been when it came to economic issues because they thought that giving a little bit here and there would stave off the desire for Americans to turn to communism. At the same time, though, because there are some superficial similarities between communism and things like trade unionism, conservatives, especially the people who were staunchly anti-communist, would really go out of their way to try to paint unions and people on the left in general as being communist or communist sympathizers. This was a very common feature of the politics of that time, and there were times when the Democrats caved into that rhetoric and abandoned uh, some of their own people who hadn't actually done anything wrong. At any rate, though, um, this was sort of how the politics of the Cold War worked and also where uh, American foreign policy became so um, unitary. Business conservatives were in the political wilderness, and they were trying to look for a way to reinvent themselves and to hone their arguments in a way that would hopefully be more convincing. So one way to do that is to meet with like-minded individuals from across the Western world and really debate these things and hone those arguments with peers. So in 1947, with lots of business funding, a group of intellectuals met at the Montpelierin Society's first meeting, and it was chaired by Friedrich von Hayek, who is a pretty famous Austrian economist. Um, the goal of the group, as uh, defined by Hayek, who presided over the first meeting, was to defend classical liberalism, or if you're familiar with it from YouTube, conservatism with an intellectual veneer, from assault by, quote, state ascendancy and Marxist or Keynesian planning. So, um, this brought together people from a wide variety of disciplines, including Karl Popper, who wrote, ab wrote about the open society and issues of free speech. However, what I really want to focus on here is the Austrian School of Economics. Um, von Mises, von Hayek, and Milton Friedman are the most famous adherents of the school, and all of them were a part of this group. Um, the ideas that they came up with uh, largely revolved around deregulation to let business do what it wants to. Um, I think they coined terms like self-regulation. Maybe that was someone else. I'm pretty sure it was someone from the Austrian school, though. And if you really think about what they're advocating, uh, a lot of what they're advocating becomes one of the key cornerstones of neoliberalism. Let's look specifically at Milton Friedman, the American in the group, and the guy who's probably had the most influence on American politics out of the three. So Milton Friedman was a libertarian. Um, he had some, I guess what you'd call, social liberal views. Um, he was in favor of legalizing drugs. He was in favor of gay rights, or at least not persecuting gay people. Uh, but he also was very right-wing on economics. Um, and he had a position of power and influence from the e economics department at the University of Chicago. Uh, and by the way, even though Friedman has been dead for a long time, the Chicago School of Economics is still a an Austrian dominated uh, place. So uh, Friedman, uh, his main sort of claim to infamy, I guess you could say, is that he taught a group of Chilean economists and he, as their mentor, um, also then had contact with the Chilean government in the 1970s and 80s and gave them economic advice. So if you ever look up Milton Friedman and the Chicago Boys, you'll learn that Friedman was corresponding with the uh, dictator Augusto Pinochet, who, with some CIA support, had overthrown Salvador Allende and set up a dictatorship. Allende was sort of like a democratic socialist or something along those lines. He certainly wasn't a communist, but he was painted that way by Pinochet and by his uh, CIA backers. 
And anyway, what ends up happening is that with Friedman's advice, Pinochet ends up imposing radical neoliberal policies. Um, and by the way, uh, Pinochet famously disappeared people. At least 3,000 people were killed by Pinochet, and a few hundred thousand left the country and settled elsewhere due to the fear of death. Uh, Friedman thought that Free markets led to political freedom, however. He was very idealistic when it came to the power of the free market, even though, ironically, he criticized Keynesians for being too idealistic about the power of government. And he said that advising Pinochet was no different than a doctor advising uh, a, a country if they had a plague. And he said that while he doesn't approve of Pinochet, he knew that inevitably the free market would set the people of Chile free, and it wouldn't matter that Pinochet had been a brutal dictator because free markets equal democracy in the end somehow by a magical quality of transference. So uh, he basically went along with foreign policy aggression, even though later in his life, by the 1990s, he decided that he was anti-interventionist. But not before he got to do his own intervention in directing the economic affairs of a foreign country that was overthrown by the CIA. So, great job. So as you might imagine, the problem with intellectual movements is that they only attract intellectuals, and intellectuals are not a large percentage of the population. So how do you take these ideas that are being developed by the Montpelierin Society and enact them in democratic countries? After all, you can't just overthrow the governments of, say, the United States and Britain, uh, the same way you can overthrow the government of Chile. So, uh, the solution, obviously, is to come up with a popularized, dumbed-down version for the masses. And that's exactly what libertarianism became. Now, libertarianism has deeper roots that go beyond the political struggles of the 20th century, but in the 20th century, it was largely taken over by the business class and then co-opted for their aims. So from the 1930s to the present, libertarianism has been more or less a reaction against the New Deal state, and it views government as an obstacle to liberty, in fact, the major obstacle, to the point that a lot of libertarians, even though they're fearful of power and organized power, are blind to the danger posed by corporations because they're so fixated with the danger posed by government. And so they need to have outreach and what they call educate the public. So in 1946 there is the Foundation for Economic Education which is basically just uh, putting a right-wing spin on economic issues and producing reports and books and trying to really uh, influence the way that people learn about these issues. David and Charles Koch who of course are very famous as financial backers for the Republican Party were key to this whole process. Uh, they really helped to organize the Libertarian Party, um, they helped to fund and organize the Tea Party, and they also funded, uh, founded the Cato Institute in the 1970s. And a lot of their interest in the Libertarian philosophy is completely self-serving because if you know anything about the Cokes, you know that they made their money through the chemical industry. So one of their key objectives is to minimize environmental regulations that would cost them money. And then they have to, um, you know, quote, educate other people about how the environment should, doesn't matter. There are other aspects to this that help to spread these ideas. Ayn Rand's novels like Atlas Shrugged and um, The Fountainhead became big successes. And, in fact, I saw something one time that, among business people and bankers, these are, those were the two most commonly read books outside of, like, the Bible or something like that. So those have had a big popular impact on sort of rank-and-file right-wingers. And also uh, probably mass shooters, too, I imagine. That was a joke, in case you couldn't tell. Another book that was published and that was a big part of this was Friedrich von Hayek's From Freedom to Serfdom, which is basically just his book about uh, how government is a threat. Uh, there were other books by Milton that were almost as famous, but not quite. And these sort of became standard educational tools. 
And if we really have to boil down what these thinkers like Ayn Rand and Hayek were advocating, it's really how does one empower the rich and powerful so that they can remain rich and powerful or even grow more rich and more powerful? That's really what the goal of libertarianism, libertarianism is, is to get the state out of the way and let rich people be rich. So, how do you do that? Well, a great approach is to create a false sense of identification with that group. So, a lot of libertarians repeat talking points about the estate tax, or about um, the government tyranny, or how government stifles business. The thing is, most of those people saying that have no business. They have no estate. These things don't affect them. But they have been convinced by billionaires like David and Charles Koch that these issues matter to them, or that they will ever be pertinent to their lives. And in many ways, while I think you, there are still plenty of business people around who are very right-wing and who maybe don't have a clear enough ideology to label them as libertarian, uh, for the most part the business libertarians after a certain point more or less became the libertarians and whatever original pre-1930s libertarianism was is long been subsumed into this right-wing libertarianism that we see today. The overall impact of intellectual conservatism, both on the more academic and the more popular level, was to create a framework of understanding and a series of platform planks that conservatives could run on if they ever got an opportunity to seize power. So after this point, we'll be looking at the events from the late 60s until 1980. But for now, let's talk about movement conservatism in a broad sense, and then hopefully what will happen is that as we go through some of the details, you'll see um, how all of the various parts of conservatism coalesced into one broad movement. So what ends up happening is that the libertarians that we've been talking about, the traditionalists who never went away, and the rabid anti-communists who were around for the entirety of the Cold War, had been opposing the New Deal and had constituted America's right wing from the 1930s to the 1960s. They hadn't really been working in concert, though, and of course, with the exception of Taft-Hartley, which was really more of, uh, you know, in power Republicans at the time, uh, they hadn't really achieved all that much. But then by the late 70s, they get two new groups that will make a big impact, the religious right and neoconservatives, both of which we'll talk about as we go along. The other big thing is that they developed a political strategy, and the strategy is one of the best political strategies that I'm aware of from any time period. And what the strategy is, is that organizers began to think in terms of a generational systemic struggle, and they made sure to educate and train a cadre of activists and potential office holders from the level of college Republicans to local and state races. This meant that even if you can't take over the country yet, you can groom people who will be ready when the time comes. And you can also produce talkers and people who can be staffers or local fundraisers and you can set up a network. Um, Laura Ingram is a great example of this. I read part of her book, Billionaires at the Barricades, where she describes the rise of Donald Trump, and she tries to fit it in with this narrative about movement conservatism, which she randomly decided to rebrand as right-wing populism, even though that is probably a pretty bad description of it. At any rate, um, if we look at her life, it really was as part of movement conservatism. From her college days until the present, she has hobnobbed with the other uh, young Republicans who grew up to become basically lifelong professional Republicans. She dated some guy who's a major player in the right-wing movement, I can't remember who, and she made friends with a lot of other college Republicans at the time, like Deepak Chopra. One other thing we'll look at as we go along are the two generations which really played into the rise of neoliberalism namely the baby boomers and Gen X. Uh, if we look at the late boomers and early Gen Xers, that's probably the most conservative group of people ever, or at least in modern history in America. 
and they played a big role. And if we look at the uh, date of birth for people like Laura Ingram and all of them, they fit right in along with that. And they were the young foot soldiers who helped to bring about the Reagan Revolution. If I really had to define what movement conservatism looks like, just imagine the basic beliefs we talked about for something like the Mont Polaren Society, and then just give it a bit of a populist styling, boil it down to a bumper sticker, and that's basically what it is. Someone like Laura Ingram has zero intellectual depth, but she has plenty of passion, so she is a great movement conservative. One of the basic features of the New Deal era is that the Republican Party became more or less a watered-down version of the Democratic Party, as we have already discussed. Well, if we look at the neoliberal era, just to fast forward a bit, the same thing is true, just in reverse. The Democratic Party became a watered-down, somewhat less conservative version of the Republican Party. So, how did that happen? Well, I'd like to start our investigation of that question by looking at the generation of leaders who emerged in the 1960s and their life's journey toward going to the right while pretending to still be on the left and still be fighting for the principles that they stood for in their youth. I'm talking, of course, about boomer Democrats. The movement to protest the Vietnam War, fight for civil rights, and fight for environmental protection produced many of the future leaders of the Democratic Party going into the 80s and all the way to the present, actually. One of the key things about this movement to remember is that a lot of the leaders were middle-class college students. Um, some of their parents had been blue-collar workers, but they certainly weren't, and they were proud of the fact that they were moving up in the world. Many of them outright rejected the lifestyle that their parents had built with the white picket fence and uh, life in suburbia and all of that kind of stuff. So they wanted to go out and do something else, and they also wanted to change the world around them. They were outraged at the abuses uh, in their world, such as segregation, and rightfully so in that case. One of the key factors here is that many of the people who ended up becoming protesters, either fighting for civil rights or um, opposing the Vietnam War, were people who were economically not very liberal. One of the features of the New Deal era, as I mentioned, is that there were issue-based coalitions. Uh, you couldn't guess someone's entire political agenda just based on their party label. At any rate, um, many of these people went on to become bankers and hedge fund managers, whereas very few of them went on to become union men or, say, work in a blue-collar labor industry. And that's key. The sympathies of this group will lie with white-collar people, their peers, in other words. What we see is that the unity that was formed among this class of leaders, the sort of cadre that they built, was based around social issues rather than economics. These are people who are mostly from well-to-do backgrounds. Um, they have a disgust that they share at blue-collar social conservatism, because a lot of liberal versus conservative on a social level um, back then and even now boils down to a class issue, but especially back then. If you'll recall, Archie Bunker is largely a racist uh, Republican because he is not educated, whereas his son-in-law went to college and he knows better. Uh, just to give one example from that period. Another major bias that emerged is that since this generation of boomers had a much higher rate of college degrees, this was something that was a, a new um, norm for them, the norm of professionalism. So they only really valued the contributions of educated people, or at least they put those contributions on a pedestal. So they were a lot less sympathetic to people who didn't go to college. Um, than they were to people who did. And because of the financial success that most of these people enjoyed, they grew up during a time with lots of opportunities, they tended to think of the economic situation of their world as being sound enough, and they decided to focus their attention on social issues, or as Joy Ann Reed once put it, values. And they really focused on these things over materiality, and if we look at the politics of most of these leaders who are still around, 
or even just the sort of rank and file members of these movements who are still around, a lot of them really still value social issues over economics. And that is one of the reasons why the Democratic Party, both in terms of the voters and especially the leadership, were more than willing to move right on economics and foreign policy in order to create a new consensus with the Republicans. So this background here is quite important. Another thing about the boomer generation that needs to be noted is that boomers on both sides of the aisle liked to utilize protest as a way to get their point across. And this is seen especially in the big demonstrations in favor of civil rights and against the Vietnam War. Those are the most famous examples. But there were counter protests as well by conservatives. There were people who rallied to keep segregation and people who rallied to support the Vietnam War. At any rate, a lot of people in America did not like these protest movements, and Richard Nixon was their avatar. Nixon ran on the slogan of law and order, and a lot of older people especially dug that, so they elected him president. Now, Nixon is complicated in this discussion because he is someone whose personal views were very clearly conservative, if we listen to the White House tapes, he very much does not understand the times in which he lives. Um, he is confused by the revelation that there are homosexuals in the world, um, for instance. But he also governs as a liberal president. If we look at his list of accomplishments, he, in some ways, is more liberal than a Bill Clinton or a Barack Obama. Nixon founded the EPA. He created federal grants for the arts. He continued the war on poverty that Lyndon Johnson had started. And he didn't do these things because he was liberal, however. He did it because he thought it's what the public wanted. He thought that at this time in history, liberalism had won out and that ideological struggle had ended. This was the way it was going to be from now on. The New Deal was never going away. At one point, he even went so far as to say that we are all Keynesians now. When someone was asking him if he was a free market guy, this is at the same period that some of these sort of right-wing studies are starting to come out, um, but Nixon dismissed them. He thought this was just a bunch of um, bullshit from wing nuts who didn't understand the nature of power. However, Nixon did have a hard edge to him in other ways. The Southern strategy, where Nixon openly appealed to racism, or I guess, to be fair, used dog whistles, he didn't quite come out and say it explicitly, um, that was about capitalizing on the fact that Johnson had passed the Civil Rights Act and alienated conservative white voters in the South. And it didn't really have all that much to do with promoting conservatism in the traditional sense of um, elite economic domination. What it did have a lot to do, though, was with promoting the Republican Party and especially Richard Nixon himself. You can't understand Nixon without understanding his love for power, which was on a Game of Thrones level. Uh, Nixon also, not surprisingly, given his love for power, enhanced the powers of the presidency, something for which he was criticized. And while Johnson and Nixon both worked to enhance the powers of the presidency, and many future presidents knew that there were problems with the way that both of them had governed and their use of the presidential powers, uh, no future presidents rolled those back. A good example of someone who was very aware of the dangers of this was Barack Obama. He criticized George W. Bush for his extensive presidential powers, and then did absolutely nothing to roll those powers back, and if anything, might have even enhanced them a little bit. Conservatives were pretty happy when Richard Nixon took power because they assumed that he was going to move them toward a conservative future. However, all of his actions showed that he was intent on governing within the established norms of the New Deal era, and that his only real interest policy-wise was in foreign policy. Domestically, he thought that the path of least resistance and the best way forward was to just go along with moderate or even somewhat liberal policy proposals. By the way, one of his other ideas that got shot down by the Democrats in Congress was to create something that would be pretty much identical to Obamacare. 
but Democrats shot it down on the grounds that they could do better than that. At any rate, um, the thing that really sent the Republican Party scrambling toward the right in large numbers was the failure of the Nixon presidency. So let me explain why I think Watergate was actually the greatest event in conservative history in terms of moving the movement forward. So, normally we look at Watergate and we think of it as something that was an absolute catastrophe for the Republican Party. And if you're talking about the moderate wing of the party or Nixon and his cronies, like Spiro Agnew, then you're absolutely right. However, it actually did a lot of good for the conservative wing of the party. If we recall, what is the central message of conservatism? The old business conservatives of the 20s or the movement conservatives of later eras or the libertarians? If you had to boil down their message to two words, that message is that the government sucks. Well, what proves that the government is irresponsible and power hungry better than Watergate? So yeah, it's done by someone on your side, but he ultimately is proving your point. You have to take away power from the government because it sucks. And if you're running as someone who says the government sucks, then you're clearly in touch with the times. Because after Watergate, everyone was of the same opinion. The government kind of sucks. So this meant that now conservatives finally came out of the shadows and they had a receptive audience to their message of the government sucks. Whereas before, the government had been producing um, income growth and increased uh, quality of life for people, but now they see a seedier side of it and they're becoming more skeptical. And hey, there are conservatives there to tell you that the government sucks. So that is how Watergate was the fuel that drove the conservative takeover of the Republican Party over the course of the 1970s. With the exception of Barry Goldwater in 1964, the Republicans had by and large tried to run moderates, and the moderates in the party were really in the driver's seat because they were seen as the only party that was politically acceptable in a country that was leaning left. So that consensus within the Republican Party about how best to move forward was broken down precisely because of Watergate. After all, it had been these very moderate Republicans who had been in charge when all of this had gone down. Gerald Ford, who succeeded Richard Nixon, tried to salvage the fortunes of the party's moderate wing, and he argued that going right would be electorally disastrous. They just needed to take their lumps for Watergate, recover, and then move on. However, the right had another factor going in their favor, aside from the fact that the moderate wing had presided over a great failure which had lessened public trust in the government, and that was that they had produced a charismatic leader in the form of Ronald Reagan. Reagan had been a right-wing activist since the 1960s at least. Um, he made some famous records where he talks about the evils and dangers of socialized medicine. And now he was the governor of California and a rising political star. And the story between 1976 and 1980 is basically the clash between Reagan on the right and then Ford trying to hold down the center. In 1976, of course, during that primary, uh, uh, Reagan mounted a decent challenge, but ultimately Ford prevailed. And then in 1980, the situation was different and the right wing finally won the nomination. But let's not go too far ahead of ourselves yet. We're not ready for Reagan. Money is the lifeblood of neoliberalism, and I think that quite a few people now understand the connection between money and politics and neoliberal policy outcomes. However, just to review and to work this into its proper place, let's look at some Supreme Court cases that allowed the rise of neoliberalism, and they're not the case that you're thinking of. Citizens United isn't the major culprit here. Actually, it's a case that occurred much earlier. If we rewind all the way back to the early 70s, um, the problem of money in politics existed, but it was pretty small. And actually, there was a bipartisan agreement that the role of money in politics needed to be reduced. So in 1971 and again in 1974, heavy reforms 
were made to campaign finance to limit the influence of money in politics. This meant uh, putting limits on individual donations, uh, prohibiting like direct contributions from the um, treasuries of companies, things like that. However, as you might imagine, conservative activists who believed in corporate liberation and corporations themselves were not happy about this, and they decided to challenge it in court on First and Fifth Amendment grounds. And then they managed to win. In 1976, Buckley v. Vallejo, which is probably one of the most important Supreme Court cases that you've never heard of, overturned a great deal of campaign finance law, and it made the crucial ruling that money counts as speech and is covered by the First Amendment. And that is the real key to conservatives really pouring in and taking over in a sustained long-term way. Because once corporate money can flow unimpeded into politics, now a takeover along the line, along right-wing lines is possible. And it will also really affect the Democrats, as we'll see. Um, also, the way legal precedents work is that because Buckley v. Vallejo established a legal principle that money is speech, this meant that further um, opening of the floodgate was allowed. So Citizens United is largely just a corollary to Buckley v. Vallejo. Anyway, um, back to the Taft-Hartley Act and how that fits into this. So without their... Um, ability to engage in things like general strikes, unions couldn't stand on their own. And what happens from the 70s into the 80s is that a lot of Democrats began to worry about how massively they were getting outspent by Republicans. Because at that before that, in the New Deal era, when they did raise money, Democrats raised from unions mostly, Republicans raised mostly from corporations. But now uh, Republicans were massively outraising them, so Democrats decided they had to do something to get some of that corporate money. And unions couldn't match their contributions of corporations. So that's part of why policies started to very heavily favor corporations. In the 70s and 80s, this is also when outsourcing really got underway, and rather than stand up for labor, Democrats began to become very soft on those issues, if we look at how the Democrats act today, they act as if organized labor is not a thing that actually exists, or certainly not a thing that they're willing to acknowledge. And the reason is because organized labor just can't pay them, whereas corporations can, and our politics is heavily based on money. So this is the long-term impact of Taft-Hartley, and also why um, for labor to really be an effective force, they have to have a series of options open to them that don't depend entirely on the support of a political party because if that political party becomes corrupted then the unions and organized labor have no options and they're left to die. At the same time that the Republican Party was rapidly shifting right and corporate money was beginning to flow in the politics meaning that the basic preconditions of neoliberalism had been fulfilled, now we have a new Democratic president in the form of Jimmy Carter. And while scholars like to call Nixon the last liberal president and Reagan the first neoliberal president, you can actually make a case for Jimmy Carter holding both titles. Jimmy Carter ran as a self-styled moderate in 1976, and that helped him win over the South once George Wallace's campaign collapsed, and he was able to win over enough rural and evangelical voters in the North to cobble together an electoral victory. He won nothing in the West or West Coast, by the way. Um, the demographics of the country and the ideological divide was quite a bit different back then. He also struggled in New England, which is another typical Democratic stronghold today. Jimmy Carter's platform, however, was actually fairly liberal. He wanted to cut military spending, something that very few candidates ran on. If we remember back to Kennedy or Johnson, they would have never proposed something like that. He also wanted to end the threat of nuclear war and reach some kind of an agreement with the Soviet Union. He wanted to form a Consumer Protection Bureau, similar to what Obama eventually founded 30 plus years later. He also was in favor of raising taxes on the rich while cutting them from, for everyone else, 
Since the 50s, the old tax policy of having a very high marginal rate um, had been slowly uh, being eroded by subsequent presidents, and Carter wanted to get back to that because that had worked really well economically. He also wanted to balance the budget. Carter, of course, did have a few conservative views, so he wanted to balance the budget. He also wanted to make some tweaks to Social Security, and he did, and those were to ensure the long-term health of the program, as it was becoming clear by this point that the um, difference between the number of people working and the number of people drawing benefits was becoming more unfavorable than it had been before, and, or, and also more unfavorable than it had been estimated. He also wanted to institute public financing for congressional races, so he was in favor of moving forward from what Gerald Ford had done and building on it when it came to implementing tighter restrictions on campaign finance. So Carter was running on a fairly solidly liberal platform, even if it wasn't completely liberal, and some of his uh, rhetoric was conservative or uh, had a conservative tinge to it. The thing that throws a lot of people off when it comes to Carter is that they focus on his puritanical streak, his moralizing about Washington, and his outsider status. And they think that that really means that he was actually a conservative Democrat, or maybe even more like a Republican than most Democrats. I read one comment online that he was kind of like a modern Republican just without the... Uh, craziness, but that's completely wrong. Carter was pretty solidly liberal, all things considered. If we look at the things that really matter, economics, foreign policy, he's solidly liberal. And that's really what defines someone. At any rate, um, another thing we can learn from the Carter 1976 campaign is that after Watergate, if you are an outsider to Washington, that counts for more than your party label. Um, Carter did not have a lot of name recognition, but because he was someone who had never been to Washington before and was relatively new to politics when he was governor of Georgia, people saw him as something new, something different, something not tainted. And while he rarely is considered the last liberal, I think he deserves the title more so than Nixon, who, as I mentioned, was only liberal when it benefited him personally and had no liberal convictions in any way. Jimmy Carter's presidency was not smooth or successful. That being said, there has been quite a bit of misreporting when it comes to why he failed and how he failed, and I'd like to try to clear that record up. So, let's look first at what happened. So, why was Carter so unsuccessful? Well, the Brookings Institute had one explanation that they put out back in 1978 that has quite a bit of merit to it. They said that Jimmy Carter was a process president, meaning that he favored the correct process for decision making over the content outcome of that policy or of setting a shared central direction for his various directors and secretaries to implement. Basically their point is that whereas most presidents have sort of a central idea that they build upon, um, Carter wanted his secretaries and department heads to produce ideas um, on their own and he thought that that was the way for the process to work correctly. So what ended up happening is that a lot of his policies were in consonant with one another and it sent a lot of confusing signals to the public. That's also part of why people debate what Carter was ideologically. It's not just because Carter was a, a president during a transitional period, it's because his administration produced policies that were kind of all over the place since they reflected more of the people who worked under Carter than Carter himself. Um, so that was one thing. There wasn't a strong leadership model that he put forward. He was not as big of a presence as some other presidents in the decision-making process. So that was a problem. Another problem that he faced was stagflation. This is the combination of high interest rates, high unemployment, and low demand, meaning the economy was stagnant and it was sort of a self-perpetuating spiral. It wasn't clear how to get out of it. 
There was also the Iran hostage crisis. This is where American citizens in Iran were taken hostage. They were embassy workers, and they were held for a long time. There was a lot of public pressure for Carter to act militarily to end the crisis, but he didn't. And in the eyes of most Americans, that made him look weak and indecisive. I would argue that by avoiding a war with Iran, he actually accomplished a great deal, and that he made the right decision, whatever the optics of that might be. He also had to deal with the OPEC oil embargo. This was at a time when the Gulf states were exercising their uh, political muscle and raising the price of oil for major consumers like the United States. This meant that there was now an energy crisis in the U.S. Carter also, um, so let's see how much is this his fault. So the high interest rates were something that he inherited from his predecessors. This was a feature of the entire decade, the 1970s. And if we add those high interest rates plus the energy crisis due to the OPEC embargo, that was really what was driving stagflation. Um, So this was something that a stronger president could have dealt with, but Carter didn't. And I think that that's really what brought him down. Now, the Iran thing gets a lot of play, and it is important, but ultimately what people vote on is how well they're doing financially. That's really what it boils down to at the end of the day. Um, However, I think Carter also deserves some credit. Now, while his solutions tended to be more virtue-based a lot of times, they were a little bit pie in the sky in that sense of he asked people to be better than themselves and to... Um, you know, go out and do things on their own initiative. You know, basically, uh, he had a very naive view of human nature, you could say. Um, He did have some ideas that were pretty solid. So he had a peaceful foreign policy. There were no interventions under Carter, and some people think that it's possible that he actually dropped zero bombs during his time as president, which would make him literally the only president of the post-war era to be able to make that claim. He also um, had a policy of setting higher fuel standards for vehicles. One of the main uh, aspects of the oil crisis was that people were having trouble keeping their fuel inefficient vehicles filled. So Carter said that the um, that Detroit would need to raise their fuel standards, something that Reagan immediately rolled back. And had Carter's regulations been built upon then the cars that you and I drive today would probably get a lot better gas mileage. He also was in favor of developing green energy more broadly. Um, He installed solar panels on the White House famously. Uh, Another thing he did was that due to heavy pressure from the right, from all the factors that we've talked about, like right-wing think tanks and corporate money and politics, Carter was pressured to begin some deregulation. However, he directed it toward air, toward areas where it wouldn't do any damage. One legacy of the Carter administration is actually the microbrewing industry. So there were a lot of uh, regulations on breweries that prevented a lot of private people from going into brewing. But Carter deregulated that industry, and that is why we have things like Samuel Adams and all of the local brew houses in your area. So Carter's Uh, legacy, if you really look at what he accomplished and where he failed, why he failed, it's fairly complicated, and there's plenty of fault to be assessed to Carter himself, but there were circumstances there that would have failed many a president. So it's not really fair to try to put Carter in one of the lowest tiers of the American presidents, or to compare his level of failure with someone like a George W. Bush. For predictable political reasons, the Republicans took a much dimmer view of Jimmy Carter than the one that I just gave you, and basically they said that everything that happened under him was his fault, and also just in general the fault of big government, and a symptom of a failing political order. And this also plays into the Republican Civil War that we talked about earlier between Gerald Ford and the Moderates versus Ronald Reagan and the conservatives. So for Ford, he would be more apt to blame this on the Democrats, whereas Reagan 
and his guys would be more likely to point that to the similarities between the moderate wing of the Republican Party and then the Democratic Party, and then say that in order to fix the problems that you see with the world right now, you need to have a fundamentally different order, and that involves going in a different direction ideologically. So, this is yet another event which plays into the hands of conservatives if we count Carter's presidency as a single event, namely a democratic administration which goes poorly and restores the viability of a Republican ticket. So what are the specific charges that conservatives leveled at the Carter administration? Well, first of all, they said that Carter gutted the military and weakened the nation. And this kind of goes along with a narrative that was beginning to form that America had left Vietnam prematurely and that we had left victory on the table. If it hadn't been for those hippie protesters, then we would have won and our honor would be unsullied. They also said that the energy crisis of the late 70s was the fault of Carter's environmental policies. If he hadn't been so hardcore about his environmental regulations and his pushing for clean energy, we would have been able to find plenty of oil and this would have never happened. They also blamed stagflation on excessive regulation and red tape, one of the hallmarks of conservative and Republican politics in our time, the neoliberal era, is that everything is blamed on regulation and red tape. That is just sort of a standard talking point and one that will get trotted out every single time they're debating any issue. By the 1990s, the Democrats embraced this narrative of Carter as part of their own justification for moving to the right. So they basically said, yeah, look, uh, we now admit that the big government era was a misstep and we need to go in a different direction. Jimmy Carter proved that. Of course, they then added, well, Jimmy Carter was a nice guy and he had good intentions, but he was a representative of a failed approach to government. So basically, this narrative which originally emerged as a campaign uh, platform, more or less, then transformed itself into a historical narrative which both parties accepted, and it now gets passed along as fact, even though really it is more or less just an advertisement for Ronald Reagan. It has very little to do with what actually happened or what would be best for the country or political reality. As I mentioned earlier, some of Carter's ideas were actually pretty good, whereas most of Reagan's ideas, as we'll see, were actually pretty shitty. The political debate, uh, which now emerges around Jimmy Carter whenever his name is invoked, which admittedly is not very often, what usually happens is that people try to figure out a way to exclude Carter from their own political group, such as, say, the progressive wing of the party, and then fasten them him onto a group that they dislike, say the conservative Democrats. Or if the Republican is making the argument, they'll try to foist Carter upon whichever segment of the Democrats they like the least. So anyway, I feel like Carter has been unjustly smeared and that we really need to take a look at the motives of the people who are talking about the Carter administration and see that they are either usually trying to promote a conservative worldview or they are trying to justify the Democrats moving to the right and then using Carter as a whipping boy so that they don't look like the corporate sellouts that they actually are. The combination of Watergate and the failure of Jimmy Carter created some important conditions for the rise of conservatism, but ultimately opportunity by itself is not enough. You have to have an infrastructure in place and that is really where right-wing think tanks came into play. So let's revisit that thread I started earlier about intellectual conservatism. So prior to the 1970s, not many people took conservatism seriously on an intellectual level. But now, by the 70s, they're well-funded and well-established, and they have think tanks around to produce studies that back up their claims. These are quasi-academic institutions that produce free market solutions to a wide range of problems. Some of their ideas include increasing military spending. Seems like every conservative study has that as one of its planks. 
Privatizing the federal workforce, that was a popular one. Privatizing prisons, well, we've seen how that worked out. Privatizing Social Security, which has been largely adapted by a couple of Democratic presidents, two of whom have tried and failed to do it. Deregulating the economy in various ways. And Obamacare, which, as I mentioned earlier, was actually proposed by Nixon. Um, he got the idea from one of these think tanks. So while I said that Nixon mostly governed as a liberal, he ultimately just did whatever he found expedient, and sometimes that included throwing in some what were at the time right-wing solutions. However, the real importance of these think tanks was not that they made conservatives feel good about themselves. Conservatives probably wouldn't have really given a shit one way or the other if these uh, policies were based on a study or not. What it does do is make these ideas palatable to Democrats. If you'll recall when we talked about boomer Democrats, one of their underlying biases is that they are very biased towards professionalism and professionals. And when you have a think tank full of people who have advanced degrees, that makes whatever they do have a sort of veneer of respectability to it even if these studies are a joke and the outcome is predetermined, which makes it not at all a study. At any rate, um, this meant that now when Republicans would come out with the same policies they tried to push in the 1920s, which are just giveaways to corporate America and big business, they can now couch it in quasi-academic terms and make it sound respectable, and then Democrats will respect it because the person presenting it will be someone like Arthur Laffer with a PhD. So let's look at a few of these think tanks. Some of them you've probably heard of. The Rand Corporation, actually founded in 1947, the same year as Taft-Hartley. Um, Rand has done quite a bit of damage to American foreign policy. The Hudson Institute, 1961. The Reason Foundation, their libertarian, 1978. Focus on the Family, 1977. Of course, they're more social conservative but they still go right along with the Republican Party, and they do everything in their power to get Republicans elected, including voting in large numbers for a guy who clearly is not very religious in the form of Donald Trump. The Cato Institute, 1974, um, that was founded by Charles Koch, and also the Heritage Foundation in 1973, one of the founders of which was Joseph Coors of Coors Beer fame. So basically, this is where all of the efforts of the people from Mott Polarin and other intellectual conservative groups really came to fruition. This is where um, the payoff came out. And ultimately, if we look at the amount of money that they had to spend for these think tanks, it paid for itself many, many times over in the tax breaks and corporate giveaways that these studies helped to bring about as they influence uh, lawmakers, it gave Republicans arguments, and it gave Democrats a great excuse to cave. If you'll recall to the very beginning of this video, I opposed calling right-wing neoliberals neoconservatives as a rule. And the reason I did so is because neoconservatism has a very specific history and meaning, and we're going to get into it now. So, during and after the Vietnam War, which of course featured military defeat, war protest, a call for pacifism and counterculturalism from the New Left, and a shoddy reception for returning veterans, there were some hawks within the Democratic Party, people who self-identified as liberal, who decided to abandon the party and went to the right. They wanted to basically make America great again, to borrow a more modern phrase and their idea of American greatness was promoting freedom and doing so through force, being strong and free, uh, to put it as simply as possible. Um, and their you know, basic idea, as I said, was to promote liberal democracy and political freedom across the world while also defeating communism, and they were not shy about using military force if need be. Their main objectives were, of course, lots of military spending, and lots of military action, because those were the keys to eventual paradise. Now, one problem I have with the narrative of the neoconservatives is that m most of them say that they used to be liberals, and then they sort of saw the light. 
But the thing is, um, if you look at how quickly they abandoned their supposed liberal principles, it really makes me question the idea that they were ever actually liberal. I will accept that they were Democrats, but not that they were liberal or ever on the left. So what we see is that when these people join the neoconservative movement, they very quickly shed their old liberal values, assuming they ever had any to begin with, and they quickly embrace religious rhetoric, the social views like being against abortion, and especially the economic policies of the right. Basically, they become in favor of supply-side economics overnight. Um, maybe it's sort of like the Roseanne Barr uh, situation where she was firmly on the left all the way and then she decided that she was pro-Israel and that the left was not pro-Israel enough and then she shifted all of her other views to match her view on Israel and now she's a super right-wing Trump supporter. Maybe that's kind of what happened to these guys. I don't know. But at any rate, I'm su suspicious of the idea that people who were intellectuals and deeply committed to a series of ideals could abandon all of them overnight like this. It just strikes me as suspect, and I bet that a good percentage of these people were lifelong Republicans who just decided to change their little brand of conservatism. Sort of like people on the alt-right claim to be completely new conservatives, but, you know, they're not really. They're just a rebranding of the same old, same old. One of the ultimate products of the neoconservative movement was the famous Project for a New American Century, which officially lasted from 1997 until 2016. They had a name change halfway uh, dur during the Bush administration. And anyway, uh, if you look at their founding uh, idea, they said that they wanted to promote American power in a Reaganite fashion. So I think you're beginning to be able to, to combine the threads here. Once neoconservatives really take power and they start to set the foreign policy agenda, then they're able to invoke Ronald Reagan's foreign policy as a model and then to use the example of Reagan in order to leverage um, their own policy decisions upon both the Republican Party and ultimately the country. Um, so, of course, the a lot of people who were major members of this group, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, went on to be major advocates of the Iraq and Afghanistan war and helped Bush to craft the Patriot Act and all of the other botched parts of our response to 9-11. In the new millennium, demographic trends have very heavily favored the Democrats and the electoral map has become more and more favorable to the Democratic Party. However, in 1980, we see the exact opposite trend going on. And what we see is that there are two key groups which are flocking to the Republican Party and making it look like the future might be a conservative one. So first of all, let's take a look at the evangelical Christian community. Carter had been an evangelical Christian and he had appealed to this community in ways that Democrats normally didn't. If you'll recall, Democrats were starting to struggle in the South and with evangelical Christians because the Democratic Party on the national level was now pro-choice and it was pro-civil rights. So a lot of conservative-minded people were not down with the Democratic Party. However, Carter had some appeal with that demographic and he had really undone the progress that Nixon had pulled off in the Southern strategy. What ends up happening is that because Carter fails and his model for a Democratic Party and for Democratic rhetoric falls with him, evangelicals now have no one in the Democratic Party that they want to support, so they decide to make a political marriage with the business class. And this creates what we now think of as the Republican Party, and it solidifies the conservative coalition. And basically what it is, it's an agreement that even though the business class doesn't actually care about social issues in any way, they will toe the line on abortion and gay marriage. And in exchange, even though evangelical Christians are largely indifferent to foreign policy and to economics, they'll go along with whatever the hell the business class wants to do. Over time, these two sides have meshed and now they actually do share each other's beliefs for the most part. But at the time, it was very much a marriage of convenience, and both sides were okay with it. This is also a move which is 
closely related to the migration of Southerners to the Republican Party from Nixon on. So it's a long-term consequence of the Civil Rights Act where the Democrats embraced civil rights and then a lot of uh, Southern Democrats decided to go Republican in order to uh, express their disapproval of Johnson's decision to embrace the black community. What this ends up doing is really setting the stage for a lot of the identity battles that will become part and parcel of the neoliberal era. So this includes the culture wars of the 90s and the modern debates on political correctness. And what this really is is a discussion on identity, something that really isn't all that important in order to distract from the fact that uh, the two parties agree on all the issues that really matter. So we see all these identity politics battles around religion, culture, and geography. These start in the 80s. Um, this is also partly because uh, the hinterlands all go Republican, the coast go Democrat. Um, so that creates the geographical divide. Culturally, you have the uh, you know, college-educated liberals versus the uh, redneck Republicans. You have the atheistic or secular Democrats versus the evangelical Republicans. It's a lot of dumb debates that shouldn't happen and that really don't move the needle forward in terms of actual substance or policy. But the evangelical migration is one of the key factors in enabling this. Had they not migrated, I'm sure that it would have happened some other way. This just happened to be the main way that it happened. And because of this, we get uh, you know 80s televangelism being a big thing. And we also get to hear about how video games and violent or sexual conduct on TV is the literal devil. The other demographic trend which really played into the hands of conservatism was when Gen X turned out to be a lot more conservative than anyone had anticipated. So it's not hard to figure out why a lot of them had a negative view of the Democratic Party and were willing to embrace the robust pro-America rhetoric of Reagan. If you'll recall, um, a lot of Americans felt that the country had looked weak during the Carter years and earlier when we had left Vietnam without winning the war. And then we have this flag-waving, um, super positive, always happy guy, Reagan, and he represented strength and energy. So a lot of the youth were attracted to that. And what we see is that while college radicalism in the 80s was not really all that big of a trend, to the extent that it did exist, the college radicals were all right-wingers, not left-wingers. In 1984, 60% of college students voted for Reagan. Can you imagine now if 60% of college students voted for a Republican candidate? That's pretty hard to imagine. Now, the thing about Gen X that needs to be kept in mind is that when you compare the numbers of Gen Xers to boomers or millennials, they're a relatively small generation, so their political impact is quite a bit less. However, their enthusiasm for Reagan made it look like the future lay with the right and with right-wing policies. This is something that was internalized by both the Republicans, who abandoned their moderate wing, and by Democrats, some of whom now started to call vocally for a move to the right. Another thing to remember about Gen X that's interesting is that a minority of Generation X ended up inventing punk music, which is a genre more or less dedicated to trashing Ronald Reagan and his conservative agenda, Dead Kennedys uh, being the chief example of this. Anyway, um, if we look at how Gen X has played out over the years, it still leans to the right, but not as heavily as it did during the 1980s, and um, certainly this is not a factor to massively exaggerate. Uh, Gen X going Republican didn't give the Republican Party some sort of generational uh, deadlock on politics by any stretch, but what it d did do is make it look like the future was going to trend right, and that was something that really encouraged a lot of people to uh, move to the right in order to prepare for a future that didn't actually end up happening. But anyway, uh, this is another is uh, example of perception really mattering quite a bit,
and of one factor helping to um, really reinforce the lesson of other things that are going on in the world, even if this factor, if you look at it objectively, was not really that big of a deal, if you just are counting by sheer numbers. So 1980 is when all of these trends come together and create the Reagan Revolution, which is more or less the official beginning of neoliberalism as a dominant political force. So Reagan swept into office in 1980, not surprising given that he was running against Jimmy Carter, but then he got shellacked in the 1982 midterms, which gave a lot of the moderate Republicans hope because they thought, well, the right-wing vision has been repudiated, so we will come back and take over the party again. And, of course, Democrats were also pretty hopeful. At this time, I think Ted Kennedy uh, was more or less the de facto leader of the party, and they were beginning to think that they were about to sweep back into power and that this supposed move to the right was a false trend. But then, in 1984, Reagan was able to win overwhelmingly against Walter Mondale, and he turned all but one state red. So, um, you, you know, that shows that Reagan certainly was a very um, electable person, and it also shows that there was some uh, support for Reagan's ideas. However, there has been a lot of mythology that's arisen about Ronald Reagan, and a lot of it stems around the notion that he fundamentally altered American politics and sort of saved the country, redeemed its honor, and changed direction altogether. But the fact is that despite the fact that he turned the map red twice, he never fully controlled Congress enough to do all the things that he wanted to do. Um, so if you look at his actual record of policy achievement, it's pretty modest. And uh, also, a lot of the things he ended up doing were fairly moderate. Anyway, though, what he did succeed in doing is completely re-engineering American political discourse along neoliberal lines. He made government into the problem, not the solution. His, one of his most famous quote is, government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem. Or he put it another time, he said the scariest words in the English language are, I'm here from the government to help, or something like that. Um, anyway, he ran on a platform that boils down to the government sucks. He was responding to Watergate, and he was elected on that, and then he governed in that same way. He always managed to retain the aura of an outsider, despite the fact that he was in office for two terms. What ends up happening is that most Republicans see the writing on the wall, and the success of Reagan really empowers them, and the moderates are more or less driven out of power. And slowly over time, a lot of moderates will actually leave the Republican Party and then join the Democratic Party. And one of the results of that is that the Democratic Party, because it's now being flooded by some moderate exiles, will move somewhat to the right. So that's part of the reason why the Democrats moved right is because the Reagan wing took power and started purging the non-Reaganites. The other great legacy of Reagan, of course, is that he is the first to implement supply-side, trickle-down, or Reaganomics, whatever term you want to use for it. You could also just call it neoliberal economics. Basically, he cut taxes for the rich and uh, deregulated the economy. Those were the two big hallmarks of neoliberalism, and they start under Reagan, but with only limited success because there was still an effective Democratic Party, despite its decline from the 1970s, and they were able to stop some of his more radical notions, like the idea of privatizing Social Security. Although Reagan met with mixed success when it came to implementing his vision, he has really been enshrined as something like the god of the Republican Party. Reagan and his administration have become the ideal and the standard for the GOP and for most conservatives. Now, there are plenty of people on the right who think that Reagan didn't go far enough or that he could have been better at this, that, or the other, but for the most part, he is the standard to whom they all pay homage. Republican debates usually boil down to who is the most like Ronald Reagan, and this is 30-plus years after Reagan uh, was president. Anyway... Um, 
what the Reagan years really accomplished for the Republicans was melding together all the disparate threads of conservative thought into one homogenous coalition. It took the movement conservatives from the streets into the halls of power in Washington. So that was really the legacy of Reagan, was taking um, that movement that had been building for 50 years and then making it a new establishment. This coalition still has some divides within it. Um, different groups still have different emphases. Um, famously, Mike Huckabee ran for president in 2008, and when he was asked about foreign policy and economics, he said, I don't care about foreign policy and economics. I care about gay marriage and abortion. But for the most part, there uh, is an orthodoxy within the Republican ranks, and pretty much everyone believes the same things on all the issues, even if some people believe certain parts of it more than others. Uh, I think that this orthodoxy, so far as I can tell, really peaked under the first term of George W. Bush, where it seemed like all Republicans were in lockstep in defending their president and his agenda. Some examples of the coalescence of this, uh, all these disparate threads are the careers of Rush Limbaugh and Bill O'Reilly. Now, for Rush Limbaugh, he is basically a shock jock, a comedian, but he also sometimes invokes Christian morality. And without there being a neoliberal Republican Party, I can't really imagine him doing that. Um, he knows that a lot of his listeners who are right-wing will also be very Christian, so he has to appease their sensibilities. Um, were all the threads of the right still separate and separable, he would probably be even more vulgar and not pretend to be religious. As for Bill O'Reilly, um, I get the sense that he is more of a traditionalist above all else. Now, sure, he seems like he's pretty anti-communist, uh, and he also comes off as somewhat religious at times, but for the most part, I think you can boil him down to being a traditionalist. Yet, he'll still pay lip service to all of the various ideals and ideas of conservatism at various times, and he'll do so willingly and with the scowl of his that passes for a smile. One fact about the Reagan presidency which tends to be ignored is that Reagan left the Republicans politically vulnerable when he left office, and his successor and former Vice President George H.W. Bush actually struggled against Michael Dukakis before taking a commanding lead and winning in grand fashion. Bush is somewhat hard to fit into the neoliberal narrative compared to his peers, whereas all of his peers that we've looked at and will look at going forward really fit the mold pretty neatly. H.W. doesn't fit it nearly as well. Part of that is because if you look at his political career, he's very hard to pin down ideologically because he portrayed himself in different ways at different times. Um, he ran as a conservative, he ran as a moderate, um, I think at one point he even tried running as a liberal Republican. Uh, the consistent thing is that he was definitely a Republican, but he could be whatever kind of Republican you needed him to be. He ran several house races and things like that, and uh, you know that's why he kept changing his branding and depending on the times and the place. In 1980, Bush was pretty firmly on the moderate wing of the party, and he was certainly no ally of Ronald Reagan. Um, he actually referred to supply-side economics publicly as voodoo economics, and he more or less said, look, Nixon was right to embrace Keynesianism, that is what people in the reality-based community do. That's how economics is supposed to work. So when he was on Reagan's ticket, it probably created quite a bit of tension, and the reason why Bush was on the ticket in the first place is to balance it out and give the moderates some say within the government. So it's kind of odd that Bush ended up being Reagan's heir apparent, since they clearly were not uh, philosophically aligned. However, despite all those earlier uh, reservations, once Bush was president, he just kept Reagan's policies in place and didn't really change anything on the domestic front for the most part. He did do a few things which are um, interesting to look at, and you can decide for yourself how well he fits the neoliberal mold. He created districts, especially for black Democrats. This goes right along with identity politics, and it also builds on Richard Nixon's Southern strategy. So in the name of providing more minority representation, 
Bush advocated for districts that hyper-concentrated African Americans and therefore created seats that were safe Democratic seats, but rendered several districts uncompetitive in the process. So basically, you got more black Democrats, but far fewer Democrats in total. Um, so it was clearly a ploy to help the Republican Party in the end, in the name of racial diversity. And that strikes me as neoliberalism 101. It's the use of identity politics for self-serving and unrelated means. Operation Desert Storm, um, clearly an intervention and a large-scale war, um, but he didn't go for regime change. He didn't try to, to end Saddam's government and replace it with a democracy. So it wasn't a neoconservative intervention necessarily, although of course the great success the American forces had in that war, where the casualty figures were lopsided in ways that have never happened in any other time in history, uh, really drove neoconservative fantasies, and especially the fantasies of his son. Uh, but Again, it's not clearly neoconservative, even if it's not incompatible with neoconservatism. The greatest achievement of George H.W. Bush, and I would argue the greatest single achievement of the entire neoliberal era, probably the greatest piece of legislation since the 1960s, is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, that alone probably makes George H.W. Bush the greatest president of the neoliberal era. Um, and I would also say he's probably the least neoliberal, but he didn't really reverse Reagan's economics, so I think he's still a neoliberal. He's just not much of one. Uh, the other thing about Bush that's interesting is that he was really only interested in foreign policy. So he's kind of like if you went back to Nixon but took away some of the extreme personality flaws and also took away a lot of the political sense. And, of course, he was not reelected, so uh, he didn't have a great deal of time to either cement a legacy as a good president or prove himself to be inept. By 1984 or so, the continued and sustained success of the Republican Party showed the political viability of neoliberalism. And the Democrats quickly took note, especially as they continued to be massively outspent by the Republicans with all of their corporate cash. In 1985, the Democratic Leadership Council formed within the Democratic Party, and its basic recommendation was to urge the party to abandon its left-leaning agenda and move to the center to attract moderates. And by left-leaning agenda, they mean pretty much all of their economic policy and also a lot of their social liberalism. So they wanted to just be a kind of republican light -like party. That was basically their goal. The DLC claimed that it combined progressive ideals with free market solutions. So basically, they would pay lip service to progressive goals, but try to achieve them by incrementalism, or get to those goals by means that are completely compatible with conservative values. They opposed economic populism, and I think that's really a fatal move because one thing that has driven the left very consistently to success is economic populism. FDR was the most successful politician in American history, and the reason for his success was his economic populism. The New Deal coalition in general held together for so long because of economic populism. With it on the table, it probably could have made a comeback, but it didn't, because that was taken off the table. The DLC also favored free trade. Um, so meaning that they were against protectionism or protecting union jobs. So this was part of their uh, let's abandon labor phase and embrace corporations. Later on, the DLC was still in existence in the early 2000s, and they fervently supported the Iraq war. Uh, that was one of the things that kind of exposed them and led to their eventual dissolution. They also founded an affiliated think tank, the poorly named the Progressive Policy Institute. Uh, there's nothing progressive about the DLC, uh, except for their pretension to stand for progressive ideals, when clearly what they're looking for is corporatism. There are similar groups that emerge in the same spirit later, Third Way, uh, which basically just tries to eschew democratic politics in favor of 
a triangulated compromise between the Democrats and Republicans, the New Democrat Network. Um, a lot of the people like Bill Clinton called themselves New Democrats, meaning that they were Democrats who didn't believe in big government or liberalism. And then the Blue Dog Coalition, who are mostly Southern Democrats who are more or less conservative all the way, except on a handful of issues here or there. And, uh, you know, really are the definition of Republican light. They believe all the same things as Republicans, they just believe them to a lesser extent. One of the major players within the DLC was Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton, better known to some as Slick Willie. Now, Bill Clinton is someone who is one of the key players in the neoliberal era, and I would argue that in terms of making the full transition from the New Deal era to the neoliberal era, he is the key figure, possibly even more important than Ronald Reagan. Because having one party espouse some ideology can bring about quite a few changes, but having the other party cave to that ideology really makes it become enshrined. And Bill Clinton is the guy who did that. So, when he first came to office, he declared, The era of big government is over. He failed to implement health care reform. He wanted to go through a single-payer system. That is what he and Hillary were advocating for early on in his presidency. And, of course, when that failed, they backed down. Later on, Hillary would then claim that single-payer is an unattainable goal despite the fact that she argued passionately, and I think well, for it in the early 90s. After the 1994 midterms, when Newt Gingrich uh, swept into power with his so-called Republican Revolution, Bill Clinton abandoned any pretense of left-leaning reform. And what we saw are reforms that were the kinds of things that Ronald Reagan had wanted to do. The passage of NAFTA. So, more free trade meant more gutting of the unions. Bill Clinton, of course, was someone who had no sympathy for labor whatsoever. He said, I feel your pain, but he was not referring to the pain of blue-collar people. He allowed financial deregulation, welfare reform. So, Ronald Reagan might have spoken out against welfare queens, but Bill Clinton did more to actually harm people on welfare than Ronald Reagan and despite the fact that the Clintons have really embraced um, identity politics and social liberalism in recent years, in the 90s they were totally kissing the asses of conservatives left and right, or actually just right, and uh, they supported vigorously DOMA, uh, the Defense of Marriage Act, which said that marriage is between one man and one woman. So basically they were uh, you know, promoting traditional marriage uh, and more or less closing the door on gay marriage. And then later, people like the Human Rights Campaign will tell you with a straight face that Hillary Clinton was the stronger candidate on gay issues as opposed to Bernie Sanders, who opposed DOMA and debated with Republicans about gay rights on the floor of the Congress. So anyway, after his, uh, you know, supposedly after 1994, Bill Clinton woke up and went to incrementalism, I would argue, however, he was an incrementalist from the start, just given his role in the DLC and his willing and eager embrace of neoliberalism. So, after 1994, what we see are incremental, minor liberal reforms on the margins, with his major pieces of legislation being deeply conservative. Um, I could probably make multiple videos about just Bill Clinton and why he's a terrible president, but I'll try to wrap it up. Some of the features that um, break out during the Clinton years that come to fully define a mature um, neoliberal era are intense partisanship. Now, you would think that caving to the basic demands of the Republican Party would make things more amicable, but it actually had the exact opposite effect. I once had a professor who said of um, internal academic politics that the smaller the stakes, the fiercer the fighting. And that actually applies to the politics of the 90s and beyond, where the stakes have decreased, uh, but the intensity of the fighting has increased dramatically. Uh, there are all kinds of conspiracy theories afoot about Bill Clinton engaging in drug deals or assassinating interns or all kinds of crazy shit. Um, identity politics really starts to take hold, and at first it starts as the identity politics of the right, right? 
and they claim that they're aggrieved by the immorality of Bill Clinton, who once smoked weed. Um, and then the culture wars break out, where people are talking about video games being too violent. Uh, another thing where the Clintons, uh, at least Hillary, came out and said that she agreed with the right on that. Um, you know, that kind of... So, basically, the politics that we see around us today really came to maturity under Slick Willie. And now for my personal least favorite president, George W. Bush. If you want to learn more about Bush, I suggest checking out the series that I'm working on called Bush 43 Still Sucks. Because no matter how terrible Donald Trump might prove to be, George W. Bush will always suck. Anyway, let's talk about how W. fits into this discussion of neoliberalism. So, going into the 2000 election, both parties now believe the same things. Uh, Bill Clinton had completed the neoliberal takeover of the Democratic Party, and most of the candidates who were running were milk toast, boring, and just Republicans with a better vocabulary. Al Gore is the ultimate example. It's very hard to point to very many differences between Al Gore and George W. Bush on policies when we look at the presidential debates. One of the main ones is actually how George W. Bush took Al Gore's left flank when it came to the issue of foreign interventions. Uh, George W. Bush was against adventurism, believe it or not, during the election. But for the most part, people weren't motivated, voter turnout was very low, and uh, there really wasn't much to choose from. They were basically the same person, and at the time there were no major crises. While there were structural problems, uh, for the most part, uh, look, the economy was doing well, and people thought that things were okay. So people weren't motivated to vote. And then George W. Bush was able to steal the 2000 election because he had a governor brother in Florida, and because the Supreme Court had five conservatives on it. So now George W. Bush has more or less seized power, but he doesn't really plan on doing anything with it. This was a pretty low-stakes election. Uh, neither of them had any plans. So Bush basically just wants to serve Bill Clinton's third term, but serve it with lots of tax cuts for rich people. And that's really what he was doing up until 9-11. He was playing a lot of golf. One third of his first, one third of the time that he was in office before 9-11 was spent on a golf course or on vacation. So he's whistling past structural issues like growing inequality, climate change, money in politics, etc. And just uh, not really doing a hell of a lot. And then 9-11 happened, largely because George W. Bush and his followers didn't know how to read intelligence reports or act in a timely fashion. And after 9-11 happened, they decided to bungle even harder in the aftermath by passing the Patriot Act and then getting us involved in a long-term war in Afghanistan, which actually did have some relation to 9-11, and invading Iraq just because. Neoconservatives were at their peak under the Bush administration. They pretty much ran the government under him. And a lot of key Democrats went right along, which is one reason why I actually did consider allowing Republicans in this video to be referred to as neoconservatives during this period. Um, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, um, a whole lot of people who were in the Senate at the time voted in favor of the Iraq War. And they also... Uh, did cheerleading for it and defended the intelligence community's assessment as presented by George Tenet and Colin Powell. Uh, George W. Bush, of course, created the security state in the process of this botched response. So next time you go through an airport metal detector or um, something like that, you know who to think. And basically, George W. Bush, on an economic level, was the neoliberal's neoliberal. Massive tax cuts for rich people, deregulation on a, an unprecedented scale, wages were stagnant, there was a housing bubble, there was a great recession, there was a bank bailout, um, you name it, it happened. When uh, Hurricane Katrina happened, there was talk about making New Orleans and that area a free market zone without any regulations and just letting business go in and do literally anything they wanted as long as they rebuilt stuff. Um, the list goes on and on. George W. Bush was a horrible president, and he was also a perfect example of why neoliberal policies are dangerous and counterproductive. 
By the time that 2008 rolled around, George W. Bush's approval ratings were in the toilet at around 20%, and the American people were ready for a change in direction. Pretty much no matter who the Democrats nominated, that person would become the next president, and the two major contenders were Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Now, Hillary Clinton was the prohibitive favorite going into it, but Barack Obama's charisma, oratorical abilities, and his attack on her based on her vote in favor of the Iraq War ultimately proved decisive. Um, so Obama became the nominee, and he got a lot of people excited with his rhetoric of hope and change. And what a lot of people read into it was that Obama would fundamentally change the way that Washington does business. I, for one, at the time, did not know what neoliberalism was in terms of a concept, but I knew what it looked like. And my hope was that Obama would change that, and he would move us away from that system, that he would move the government more towards something like it had been under FDR. And Obama employed some populist rhetoric on the campaign trail, and he pretty much spelled out the ills of the Bush administration pretty well. So I felt pretty confident that he had a handle on things and that he would do a good job. And many other people felt the same way. I was hardly alone in that. However, it turns out that Obama had no such intentions and that he represented change on the outside, continuity on the inside. Um, he is the ultimate example of identity politics being used for cynical ends. He is supposed to represent change because he's a black guy, the first black president. But really, he was Bill Clinton 2.0. So, yeah, he's an improvement on George W. Bush, but so would my dog. My dog could do a better job than George W. Bush. That's not an accomplishment. So, uh, anyway, what Obama ends up becoming is an incrementalist who implements minor changes. So, again, basically Bill Clinton 2.0. Obamacare is probably the second most important piece of legislation of the neoliberal era, but it really didn't go nearly far enough and it left the fundamental problems unaddressed. Um, it does help people some, but ultimately it also was a corporate giveaway. He has some environmental policy improvements. Uh, he founded the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that Jimmy Carter had wanted to found back in the day. Uh, but otherwise, most of the things he does are pretty much just small tweaks and uh, weren't really all that meaningful or impactful. And like Bill Clinton, he was faced with a major Republican backlash. So in 2010, the Tea Party swept into power, the Democrats lost about 60 seats, and then Obama said that we just got shellacked and I'm going to back off. So after that point, he pretty much gave up on liberal reforms and just became an incrementalist. So, despite the fact that the Democrats controlled the White House for eight years, and that Obama had a supermajority for two years, and controlled the Senate for, I think, uh, four or six of those years total, there were no major advances in economic or foreign policy under Barack Obama. In fact, in foreign policy, he continued all of Bush's policies that he had attacked on the campaign trail, and also intensified the rates of drone strikes. He even attempted to make a grand bargain with the Republicans, and that grand bargain would have achieved something that is one of the central goals of neoliberalism, to privatize Social Security. Supposedly, the deal was he, that he approached uh, John Boehner and Mitch McConnell with was that he wanted to trade privatizing Social Security for legalizing gay marriage on a national level. So it's a completely bizarre trade that only makes sense in a neoliberal context. So despite the fact that Barack Obama, you know, came across as cool and he could make good jokes and he did a good job at the press correspondence dinner every year and all of that, ultimately he was a neoliberal and he was in many ways just a smarter version of George W. Bush. Complete disappointment to say the least. By 2016, there were a couple of countervailing trends in politics that pundits really failed to make heads or tails of. On the one hand, Barack Obama was still personally popular, at least for a second-term president about to leave office. But on the other hand, the country on both the left and the right was anti-establishment, 
and wanted a fundamental change in direction. We see that in both sets of primaries. On the Republican side, of course, Donald Trump ran as an anti-establishment candidate, and he won. On the, the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders ran, a relatively unknown senator from Vermont, and he nearly managed to pick off Hillary Clinton, who had arrayed the entire party apparatus behind her prior to the race. Um, and anyway, in the end, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but... Trump managed to win because Hillary and her campaign staff didn't understand how the Electoral College worked, possibly didn't even understand that it existed. At any rate, um, this left Donald Trump as the president. And Trump can't really be said to have any clear ideology, um, but he's basically implementing neoliberal policies, but doing so with a populist panache that most of his predecessors couldn't really do. The thing is, though, a lot of people aren't fooled. Trump's approval ratings have been hovering around 40% pretty much the entire time he's been in office, and uh, people realize that this was not the change that they had been hoping for. The Democratic Party is currently in a fierce civil war that's pretty comparable to what the Republicans were going through in the 1970s. The Bernie wing is trying to take over in ways similar to the way that uh, movement conservatism took over the Republican Party but they're actually doing it at a must, much faster rate. Um, so that's one major trend that's going on. We'll see who rises to challenge Trump in 2020. Depending on the outcome of the Democratic Civil War, that will impact when, where, and how the neoliberal era comes to an end. But make no mistake about it, the neoliberal era is ending. It might manage to cling on for another cycle or two, but the thing is, uh, people are fed up with it. Uh, the emperor has been exposed, and between Bush and Trump, and also Obama, and Bill Clinton too, I guess, if you actually uh, keep up with politics closely, it, we, we all get what neoliberalism is, and no one's really in favor of it. It just doesn't benefit most people. There's no reason to keep it around. Um, so, anyway, hopefully this has laid out neoliberalism and the history of the neoliberal movement in a way that is accessible and useful, and hopefully this will be a good primer for understanding the presidents as I lay them out one by one, and also for really understanding where I'm coming from in my Bush 43 Sucks series. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian.